So our next topic, as you can see from the slide, is titled All STEM Leads to Rome, Teaching the Classical World Through Engineering and Experimental Archaeology. And we have uh, Natalie Roy uh, presenting for us, and she teaches Latin, Roman technology and myth makers to teenage students in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in the USA. Her classes center the classical world of Rome through the lens of STEM, hands-on history and experimental archaeology. Her students have built kilns, sundials, catapults and a Roman road in large collaborative projects that involve local industry through partnerships and grants. A national board certified teacher, Natalie was named the 2021 Louisiana State Teacher of the Year, an experience that took her to the White House to meet President Joe Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden. Last summer, the American Classical League named Nathalie its Merita Award winner for lifetime service to the field of classics. She is too young to retire, so she runs a small website dedicated to teaching a, dedicated to classical STEM lessons for busy teachers and presents her lessons at classical conferences all over the USA. Nathalie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, in just a second, you'll see that QR code popped up right here on the screen. And if you would like access to this presentation, you can use that QR code to do so. And um, my presentations have lots of links in them, including my website, my link tree, my blog. So please access those and use them as you need. Oop, I'll go back to here. So for two and a half decades, I taught at an elite private school in my city of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where curricular resources were vast. When STEM became the rage in education in the early 2000 teens, my school was quick to hire a STEM coordinator whose job it was to assist core teachers in integrating STEM into their classes. Riding on this wave of STEM excitement at my school, I proposed an upper level Latin STEM integration course called Roman Technology, in which my students would read Latin texts which covered STEM topics, such as Vitruvius's De Architectura and Pliny's Historia Naturalis, and then employ experimental archaeology techniques to recreate the products and processes that we read about. The school STEM coordinator was thrilled to help me, and I developed an amazing course in which we mixed and set Roman concrete, plotted an anilomatic sundial, recreated hairstyles, cooked Roman food, built Roman musical instruments, etc. It was a smashing success in that students outside of my Latin program were asking for me to offer the course for non-Latin students. Unfortunately, that was not to be. That spring, I found out that the headmaster of my school had decided to phase out our decades old Latin program and wanted me to transition into a technology facilitator role. I quickly found another job teaching middle school Latin at a local large public school. And since the principal wanted to expand the school's offerings of elective classes, she asked if I might be able to adapt the Roman technology class to include non-Latin students, and also if I might teach a class on classical mythology. And as you can probably guess, I accepted the job, and I am now in my sixth year of teaching both the Roman technology class and the other one, which I named Mythmakers. This mythology class is a steam maker lab class in which we use the stories of classical mythology to inspire, to inspire maker projects. Steam, STEM's close cousin, adds the A to represent art in the acronym. And that was five years ago. And these two classes are now some of the most popular offerings at our school. To give you an idea of my curriculum, I'll discuss two of our smaller projects and one large project in greater detail. I'll also elaborate on how I incorporate STEM methodology. But before I do that, let me clarify what it means to teach STEM. STEM in K-12 education is more of a methodology than a collection of subjects. It's not just science, technology, engineering, and math but using those subject areas to spark creative and critical thinking as well as collaborative skills in the service of a design challenge. It's very much a way of thinking and learning rather than just instruction in the subjects which the acronym stands for. Some STEM teachers are even more exclusive in categorizing STEM. All the subject areas have to be represented and the challenge or problem has to have more than one solution. Others are less restrictive, but still, it's worth noting that what STEM teachers consider STEM is not always what the general public sees as STEM per se. 
So now I'll discuss a very popular STEM challenge from my Roman technology class, catapults. Since weapons, even replicas, are not allowed on our campus, we focus on many models and the concepts which make Roman catapults so effective. We start the unit with a short lecture on the history and development of catapults in the Mediterranean world, focusing on the material remains, such as catapult shot at Masada, which you see here, and images of catapults on Trajan's column. Throughout the lecture, students are asked to read short articles and watch videos of replicas in action, including a passage by Josephus on the violent effects of those being attacked. The students also read selections in translation from Vitruvius's book 10 of De Architectura about the size, weight, and aerodynamic qualities of different projectiles and their construction of a scorpion itself. Vitruvius was a scorpion operator in the Roman army of the first century BCE. Next, the students learn to build three mini models of catapults out of simple materials, such as tongue depressors, rubber bands, and bottle caps. After each build, students must test their catapult's performance in three challenges. Number one, distance. The students shoot their catapults as far as possible, then measure and record data with each different projectile they use, cotton balls, ping pong balls, and small rocks. Next, we've got accuracy. The students have to shoot the projectile into a bowl and record data. And number three, tower, the tower challenge. The students have to record how many shots they fire to knock down a tower made of paper cups. In each of the challenges, there is a variable and a constant for the students to take note of. In the next step of the unit, students use the information they learned in these initial challenges to construct their own catapults, constrained by the supplies they're given. Students whose catapults perform best are asked to model their shots and explain why they think it worked so well. And likewise, students whose models flopped must reflect on why they failed, and they're allowed to tweak their models for better performance and try again. Surely, the Romans worked in the same way. The second unit I'd like to share is from my Myth Makers course. Focused on mythological stories that reference sea travel, such as Jason and the Argonauts or Homer's Odyssey, students design and build a cardboard boat that can stay afloat while it holds a half pound of weight. They must sail this ship across a small swimming pool powered only by their breath caught on the sails that they've built. So following the engineering design process, the students first learn a little about ancient seafaring, the life of sailors, ships, and buoyancy to help them ask and imagine how ancient ships worked. This is the first part of the STEM challenge process. Then after exploring the supplies and hearing the constraint about the constraints for the project, they plan and create their own ships from cardboard, masking tape, and recycled cloth. Through the process, they test their ships, improve them, and then share their designs by sailing them in a small swimming pool. It's always fun to see what such young students, only ages 11 to 14, are able to build. Now, models are fun, and they teach students how to work with building supplies, think creatively, and work collaboratively. But experimental archaeology gives students a deeper appreciation for ancient engineering, tool use, and the real life experience of ancient daily life. Every time I teach Roman technology, I commit to doing a large collaborative project in which I lead the students in building something real. In our first year, we built a 20-foot analematic sundial that uses the viewer's shadow to tell the time. We used mosaic hammers to create the mosaic scene in the picture. In our next year, the students worked in small teams to build brick pottery kilns and fire their own votive body parts. This past year's endeavor was the Roman Road Project, the largest we've ever attempted. So I'll talk about that a little bit now. Through the middle of our 1955 school campus runs a large grassy area that generally floods when it rains. My classroom looks out over this area where in 2020, right before the pandemic shutdowns, my Roman technology class watched a student trying to traverse this stretch of soggy grass. 
he was unsuccessful in doing so without getting his shoes completely wet. Despite this problem, many students continued to use this pathway due to the fact that our halls are old and too small for our students, since our school was originally built as an elementary school for much smaller children. My Roman technologists laughed at the soggy shoed student and jokingly said that a Roman road would probably help the situation since they were elevated and kept water off of them. Eureka, an idea was born. We would build a functioning sidewalk in the style of an ancient Roman road. Fast forward to 18 months later and I applied for and secured a grant from a local bank for the Roman road project. Working alongside our local Department of Transportation and Development, my 78 Roman technology students studied many aspects of Roman road construction. We learned to pace the space like Roman land surveyors would have done to measure and order needed supplies. We surveyed the land and marked a straight course for the road using gromas, ancient surveying tools. We hauled 42 tons of stone in buckets to simulate the experience of Roman road building soldiers seen on Trajan's column. We learned to mix concrete. Although our intention was to erect milestones, we ran out of funding and decided to decorate and lay stepping stones instead to approximate the experience. The project took two months and was not without setbacks. On the day before Mardi Gras break, as we had finished our concrete pour, someone rode a bike through the wet concrete of our road, leaving behind deep ruts that were unfixable. We had long discussions about what to do, and we finally decided to fill the ruts and footprints with metal colored resin to simulate how the Romans used iron to fix ancient roads in Pompeii and ancient Britain. Although upsetting at first, this incident surely mimicked the life of ancient Roman road builders and engineers that solved multiple problems at every turn. The best part of the project was our collaboration with the local Department of Transportation and Development, or DOTD. Dr. Tyson Rupnow, Associate Director of the Transportation and Research Center, the research arm of the DOTD, personally advised us on the project, giving many lectures on modern and ancient civil engineering and obtained supplies for the project, such as gravel and concrete. Tyson was able to work with us so closely because it's actually part of his job description. DOTD gives free advice on road building projects to anyone in the state. This project became his pet because according to him, Roman roads are mythologized within preparation programs for civil engineers. Thus, he regularly hosted civil engineers and construction professors on our campus to view the project, which they viewed with extreme interest and almost envy. The most interesting part of the project, in my opinion, was learning to use the Roman groma. Having read extensively about these and consulting with Dr. Courtney Roby of Cornell University, whose classes use them for hands-on surveying projects, I was able to guide a woodworking expert in building a couple of these devices. The most difficult part of using a groma is wind blowing the lines out of alignment and making it nearly impossible to actually sight using them. But fear not, we used an ancient Roman trick. We placed small dishes of olive oil under the plumb bobs to stabilize their sway in the wind. Both Tyson and I were skeptical about this plan, but it worked like a charm, and it definitely made us consider the lives of ancient surveyors and road builders. To get the oil at just the right level under the plumb bobs, we used ancient survey, we used various uh, pieces of scrap wood to build up a small pedestal for the oil container. Would a surveyor have had to carry these around in ancient times? <laughs> How would that have worked? In fact, we had lots of questions. The whole project left us wondering about many aspects of daily life for soldiers who bore most of the burden of building Roman roads. Our biggest question was about footwear. We wore rubber boots for the entirety of our project to protect us from the massive amount of mud which we created and excavated as we built. How did Roman road builders protect their feet from the mud that surely have had, had to have happened with road building? 
Side note, we plan to take up this topic during our next big Roman technology project as we try to design and build our own Roman shoes. Even as the project began to wind down, the students continued to dream big and asked for a ribbon cutting ceremony. Thanks to my principal and DOTD, we were able to pull together a short little ceremony with handmade golden laurel wreaths and cake. We invited the media and the local newspaper featured our project on the front page. A month later, I got an excited text from a Latin teacher friend in the same city who told me that her minister was talking about our Roman road project in her sermon at sun, uh, on Sunday morning. A couple months later, I attended a lecture on Roman soldier reenactment at Tulane University by a Latin professor from North Carolina. When I raised my hand to ask a question, I introduced myself as a teacher of Roman technology. He stopped me and asked if we were the ones who had built the Roman road, <laughs> that Roman road. Hopefully we'll continue to spread the word that STEM and classics can indeed work together. As I finish up my story, let me ask you a question, listeners. Do you expect all of your students to become Latin or Greek teachers? It's something hard for classics teachers to accept, but not every one of our students is going to make our dreams come true. <laughs> they are going to be something though, and why not spark their interest in a STEM-related field while still teaching them the classics. American STEM fields, including civil engineering programs, are having trouble recruiting students, as is the STEM workforce. Instead of viewing STEM as our competitor, we classics teachers and promoters should be looking for ways to incorporate this popular and important pedagogy into our classes. Thank you. That was fantastic thank you so much and we have a lot of people through the various chats that this is uh this video is going out on saying that they really wish you had been uh, their teacher um <laughs> uh, so um, i hear that a lot <laughs> i believe it um would you mind just stopping your screen share because i think it's just a big picture of my face yes <laughs> thank you very much Okay, perfect. There we go. And I wanted to, go. we've, got, we've got a few minutes before the next presenter is due on. I was wondering, do you get an awful lot of pushback from people when you talk about connecting STEM with the classics? And when you get that pushback, is it from typically one, like, do you get it a lot from classics? Do you get it a lot from other STEM teachers? Or just everyone thinks that this is an insane idea? Um, I think it's, mainly from teachers, uh, teachers of especially languages who, um, you know, are, are comfortable teaching languages, right? Um, and I get that. Um, some people will say, you know, language teachers will say, oh, I'm not a math person or I'm not a science person. I think they also see STEM as, as I said in the presentation, a competitor for these elective classes because in, you know, most, especially American schools, classics is considered elective, right? It's an elective class. It's something that students choose. So some students simply aren't interested in just the language-based classes. So my idea is to kind of pull in kids who aren't really interested in language, but they're interested in mythology and they're interested in STEM stuff. Um, I have students who take my classes, a lot of French and Spanish students who take my Roman technology class and myth makers classes because they're simply interested in those topics in addition to the other languages that they want to take. Um, I like to expand the idea of classics to not just languages, but you know everything um, that the classical world entails. I think that's wonderful. And I think that is definitely the a, a key way to get more people interested because there is so much more to the ancient world besides philology, besides the study of language. Um, I had a very Absolutely. practical question next. How did you manage to fit in constructing a Roman road with your class time? Like, was this something that happened on evenings and weekends? Did you take class time to do it? What, how did that work out? Okay, so just to be clear, this is an actual class. It's called Roman technology. So we do not study 
Latin. We do not study language during this, this time. It is just focused on different topics, Roman technology topics from the ancient world. And my definition of Roman technology is if the Romans used it, then that is something we can consider Roman technology. So it's a very broad definition. So I loved um, Nermeen's presentation before mine. I sent her a message. I wanted to connect with her because we actually do a hydraulics unit where we look at the shadoof. They actually build shadoofs and, you know, move water with them. So um, the Romans used shadoofs as well. There is archaeological evidence of shadoof use by the Romans. So I to that Roman technology, even though it was probably invented by the Egyptians. Um, we do a whole unit on writing and we cover papyrus, even though, you know, papyrus is an Egyptian product invented by the Egyptians. So, you know, if the Romans used it, we're going to study it. So it's a very broad definition. And yes, we had time. I mean, when you have 78 people, this is one of the things we realized, you know, you think, oh my God, we've got to move 42 tons of stone by hand. But we were able to do it, you know, three hours a day with 78 people doing it. Um, you know, a lot of hands can do a lot of a, a lot of work. That's fantastic. And just from the the pictures that you showed, the kids obviously had a really fun time with it. <laughs> they did. One of the comments I got when this project kind of came to a close was, "Miss Roy." Are, are we going to go outside anymore now that we're done with this project? They love being outside, you know, even though it was chilly on a lot of the days that we, we built it in where I'm from, uh, where the school is, it's very hot here. I mean, it's always really warm. And so we planned it to where it would be during the colder months so that, you know, it wouldn't be too hot. And so we really did have some cold days. I mean, it was, you know, 35, 40 degrees. But what we realized as soon as we got out there, you know, jackets came off. Um, we were doing just great because we were doing that physical exertion. Um, I had a lot of students also tell me that during this process, they met people in the class that they had never talked to before, that they had never realized were, you know, friends for them. And to me, that was that was special because not only are they having fun and being outside and learning, they are, you know, expanding their, their social realm. And, you know, you imagine like, how did soldiers work together? It, it has to be like very similar. How do you get the ideas for all of the different things that you do with your classes? I'm, I'm assuming there are some that you run semi-regularly. You probably can't do a Roman road every year. Um, but right. where, where, do you, where do you get all of these new ideas? Uh, the catapult idea is actually something I, I've kind of adapted. It's a very popular STEM lesson, actually. Almost every STEM curriculum has a catapult lesson in it. The catapult uh, lessons are used to teach force and motion, which are very um, important concepts in science and STEM classes. So, you know, there's that, you know, I looked at some STEM stuff and said, wow, okay, there's a really classical component to this that's not really being covered by the STEM teachers, probably because they're not humanities teachers, they're not history teachers, they are covering from a purely scientific perspective, which is great. But, you know, adding these layers of, um, you know, background to it just makes it all more meaningful. Um, it's interesting to think of catapults, you know, they're, the first thing we start with is catapults are, were a weapon of death. I mean, they were meant to kill people. You know, here we are like in STEM classes teaching, oh, let's build a catapult, yay. You know, I think we should stop and say, wait a minute, you know, catapults are, yes, they're used in space technology now and airplane technology now, but they started um, from a very different, you know, perspective. And I think it's important to remember that. So that's just one of the one of the places I get ideas from. But others are just, you know, reading Vitruvius. I mean, I got so many great ideas just reading Vitruvius. Do you have students be surprised at the range of technologies that the classical world produced that either they have heard of or are still in use in some form today? Absolutely. In fact, the hydraulics unit I was talking about earlier, we actually connect to our modern um aquifer here in the city of Baton Rouge. Our aquifer is, is actually, we have some of the best water in the country of, of the United States. And we, you know, we don't, many people think, you ask students, where do we get our water? 
<laughs> many of them will say it from La Fawcett. I mean, they have no clue, but they think that we get it from the Mississippi River, which we do not. We have an aquifer and it's great, but it's being over pumped by the chemical companies in our state, in our along the river, in our city. So it's a great way to connect that to something that we're doing, you know, that's affecting our lives in modern times. And then you take that and compare it to, okay, the Romans had a completely different way of managing water. They had, you know, the, the Romans would take the water that wasn't very clean or didn't taste very good, and they would use that to flush out the baths, right? But the good tasting water, they would, you know, filter it and use it to drink because their system was set up to do that from the very beginning. Our water systems are not set up that way. So it's a really interesting thing to show kids about how in some ways ancient technology is more nuanced and better than ours. Um, you said in, in your introduction that you have um, lesson plans available online for other teachers who are interested in combining these kinds of things in their own classroom. Would you mind just talking a little bit about that for people who are interested? Yes, the website is called... Um, creativeclassics.org, important, the O-R-G, because I think if you put in creativeclassics.com, you'll come up with some furniture. <laughs> so creativeclassics.org and go to the button that says lessons. And there you will find all kinds of um, lessons. I have a mosaic lesson. I have a writing lesson. I have a lesson on Roman dice boxes. It's a STEM challenge where you just use cardboard and tape. It's super simple. There's not a lot of, uh, in, you know, expensive supplies involved in this. You're just using literally cardboard and tape to recreate something that was used by Roman soldiers as a symbol of status, you know, in their daily life playing games. Um, so there's all kinds of things there that you can access for free. I also, one final question before we move on, I wanted to ask how difficult you found it to secure funding for your Roman road project, because I, I feel there's a, a conception among a lot of people that actually funding for big projects like this, especially education, especially humanities and classics is quite hard to come by. Did you mm -hmm. find that was the case? Uh, for humanities? Yes. For STEM? No. Um, a lot of times, and this is again why I truly believe that harnessing our chariots to <laughs> STEM projects are, is just a really good idea because there is a lot of funding out there for STEM education. Um, the STEM um, industry, they want workers, they want students to consider STEM as a career early on. And they've realized, they've done the research, they've done the work, that the earlier you can hook kids on you know, STEM, the the better, you know, the more people they're going to have to choose from. So um, when you apply for grants, oftentimes these grants are for STEM projects. So I find that, you know, having that STEM aspect and adding in the humanities perspective just makes for a really unique project that stands out to the people who are, you know, looking over these applications. And yes, the Roman Rose Project, we got, we had a grant of 2,500 and then we also secured another one for 500. That was not nearly enough for what we wanted to do, but partnering with DOTD allowed us to get even more, you know, access to funding and supplies. Um, our consultant, Dr. Rupnow, would literally call people that he knew in the field locally and say, uh, we need 42 tons of stone next week. Can you do that for me? And they said, yes. <laughs> I don't know how, you know, that's just, it was just a great partnership. Uh, when you partner with people that know people and are friendly with the industry, it, it's just like a foot in the door. Really helpful advice all around. Natalie, thank you so much for sharing um, your time and your amazing projects. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Of course.